So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the uh, journalism recommendations first. And Mizell Stewart, who with Rainey Aronson uh, from Frontline, was the co-chair of the working group on journalism. So Mizell, I'm hoping that you can summarize Absolutely. for our audience. Thanks, Jennifer, and good morning, everyone. We uh, put together recommendations for journalism uh, uh, in four areas. And let me just say, uh, uh, just as a preamble, uh, the commission uh, worked for almost two years, took uh, testimony and received input from dozens of experts uh, as well as uh, individuals who are very interested in, uh, in this concept uh, of rebuilding trust uh, in, in the media and rebuilding trust in, in institutions. And it's been a really uh, collaborative process. And the first, the recommendations are really in four areas, transparency, rebuilding local journalism, uh, innovation and diversity and inclusion. And when we talk about transparency, we actually coined a phrase, calling it radical transparency. The idea behind radical transparency is pushing back on journalistic norms of, you know, we will do it and people automatically know what we do and why we do it. We believe that a, uh, one reason for the decline in trust is, has been the, the resistance in journalism circles to actually explain journalistic practices, uh, journalistic norms, and essentially why we do what we do. And we think it's a radical concept to say to journalists, explain yourselves. Um, Tom Rosenstiel, who was one of the uh, folks uh, who helped us uh, formulate our thinking in this process, um, Tom is the executive director of the American Press Institute, uh, Tom said, you know, rebuilding trust is not a matter of changing or adapting journalistic values. It is a matter of adapting journalistic practices, and we, we, really, we really took that to heart. Uh, when it comes to um, the trust in journalism as it relates to uh, the interactions people have with journalists, what we've seen in local journalism is a significant decline in the number of journalists in communities around the country. And so we feel that rebuilding local journalism putting more boots on the ground in communities uh, across this country uh, is, is an imperative. When, uh, when you know a journalist, uh, I, I like to say, you know, when I was in uh, local newsrooms, when I ran into people in the supermarket, when I saw people in church, people didn't see me as some of this, this nameless, faceless uh, elite known as the media. What they saw was one of their neighbors uh, and, and, one of their, and one of their friends. And so the decline in local has meant that fewer people truly interact uh, on a personal level uh, with journalists. And so we want to, we recommend rebuilding local journalism through new nonprofit uh, and for-profit models. Uh, we are grateful uh, to uh, the Knight Foundation and others in this room who are uh, seeding projects such as Report for America, the American Journalism Project, because those are all uh, aimed at putting more people in communities to practice accountability journalism. Collaboration and partnerships are also uh, very critical to rebuilding local journalism. Uh, both uh, nonprofit uh, organizations working, working together, for-profit organizations like ours collaborating with nonprofit organizations. Uh, I was struck by uh, a statement Evan Smith uh, made, um, uh, co-founder of the Texas Tribune yesterday. Uh, he said, uh, we're, we're, we're not about competition, we're about collaboration, and that's really the key. Um, innovation is about embracing technology. Uh, we, uh, many of us uh, who come from legacy journalism environments, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, rightly concerned about the influence of technology as it has related to local news and information, uh, but uh, we almost have to run to the fire. We have to embrace technology when it comes to two things. Uh, one is using technology to combat misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and, and truly mastering the digital transition 
from legacy platforms to the way people are consuming news and information today. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion. Uh, we want a journalistic workforce uh, and journalism organizations to reflect America. Uh, to reflect America in terms of race and gender, uh, but also to uh, reflect America in terms of uh, social economic status. Uh, journalism has gradually become, uh, we fear, more of an elite profession. Uh, and when that happens, uh, we don't have the authentic voices of people uh, in marginalized and underserved communities. One of the organizations we looked at uh, as part of the work of the commission was City Bureau in Chicago uh, because it elevates uh, people, individuals, voices from uh, neighborhoods in uh, uh, urban Chicago uh, and helps teach them journalistic uh, practices. And they are participants in their own local information ecosystem. So those are just the highlights. Thank you, thank you. Charlie, a big part of the discussion was about uh, bias and, and perceived bias as part of Knight's effort to take on um, these questions and challenge, challenges. Uh, Knight funded the Gallup organization to uh, conduct polling um, to really understand uh, how widespread and to the extent of the perception of, of, of bias. And what, what might journalists and, uh, do to address these very real concerns? Well, first of all, I, I, I want to really thank everybody for letting me participate in the Knight Commission. And the deliberations were fascinating. We had a very diverse group of people. And I did change my mind on a lot of things. But I, I, I come from this from a different point of view, you know, having been having a foot in, in both worlds, you know, being a conservative talk show host, but also being on MSNBC. I, I sort of see the, old, the alternative realities that we've created. Look, um, in, in a lot of ways, um, this is the best of times and the worst of times. I mean, the, some of the best journalism of our lives is being published on a daily basis, some of the best storytelling, some of the best investigative reporting. And at the same time, as you point out, you have 40% or more of the public that just shuts it out, that just will not believe anything. And I think this is, this is the challenge. This is why it is, so, it is so grave. Not only have you had local journalism being hollowed out, but this distrust is ingrained. It's been building for a long time, and now um, it's been weaponized, politically weaponized. So um, I do think that among the things that uh, the media has to do, and this is a very hard thing to do, and I understand this, is to engage in some introspection, look in the mirror and ask why do so many people think that we are biased? And clearly this is difficult because you don't want to give oxygen to the kinds of demagogic attacks that you're getting from a president who says we are the enemy of the people, right? But on the other hand, you have to say, you know, you know were there things that was, was done by the media that um, fed this over 20 or 30 years? And, and I have to say, that um, I think that there has been a lack of, of introspection, a lack of uh, serious questioning about the question of bias. And I think it's important to do that if you're going to fight back against what I think is the very grave threat to First Amendment rights, free press rights, uh, from a weaponized political environment, including when you have a Supreme Court justice who's talking about overturning Times versus Sullivan. Now, this is a dangerous time because the consensus, the public consensus, for press freedom has been eroded um, in terms of bias. Now, what do I mean by bias? I mean, in part, it's, and, I, and I, I'm sorry to re repeat the phrase that I've used before, but I do think that a lot of people in newsrooms do not feel that they are biased in the same way that fish don't know they're wet. <laughs> because they are surrounded by people who hate the same people they hate. They look down on the same people. They have the same political views. They regard their point of view as the default setting and people um, who disagree with them as, uh, as, as outliers. And I think that that needs to be, to be challenged. I also think that the media, and this is what makes it so difficult right now, I think the media needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be aggressive. It needs to push accountability. I actually think it is a good thing that the New York Times says that the president makes false claims, puts the word lies in headlines because I think you have to label a lie a lie. I think this is a good thing to do. But I would also strongly say two other things. Number one, really make sure you get it right. 
because every error is absolutely weaponized and feeds this vortex of distrust. And secondly, if you're going to hold people to tough standards, which I think you need to do, make sure they are consistent standards. Something that is a felony for a Republican should not be a misdemeanor for a Democrat. If you're going to say that Donald Trump lies, which I think you ought to do on a regular basis, make sure if, I don't know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says something that's untrue, that you also hold her to the same standard. And uh, you know, I, so I do think that this is something that needs to be addressed. I, you know, the, the, the commission, I think, did wrestle with this, did discuss this, does acknowledge it. And uh, going forward, I think that's going to be part of what it's going to mean to, to do this. Also, I just throw out, we had very interesting discussions about diversity. And there's no disagreement, I think, on, on the Commission on Diversity. But when I was coming up, before I was in radio, I was actually a reporter for the Milwaukee Journal, um, which at one time had you know, 200, 300 plus reporters. We covered local government. I lived in Milwaukee City Hall on a regular basis. I don't think there's any reporter that does what I used to do. But also, in the newsroom, I used to sit next to people who went to bars with cops, who grew up in blue-collar families, who really knew the, uh, the, the community. So when we're talking about diversity, I also think that diversity of points of view, diversity of, of income is, is, also very, very, uh, is, is also very important. Um, and I would also just challenge those of you in public media who are doing such incredibly good work as storytellers and who will play an absolutely essential role in dealing with the news deserts and the ghost newspapers. And if there's any solution to this, it's going to be new partnerships, new economic models. Ask yourself, how many conservatives do you have on the air in your newsroom? How many conservatives do you know? How many evangelical Christians do you know? It, it, and the answer to that question may tell you a little bit about why there is you know, the challenge is ahead. Not, this is not an indictment. This is not to say, you know, you need to be in sackcloth and the ashes. But if you want to rebuild trust, you have to ask, ask those questions. I'm sorry, that was a long answer. But. Yeah, no, yeah. and just to, just to add to that, what we also know, of course, is the um, low, le low levels of trust over many years um, earned low levels of trust um, among people of color in many communities around the country because newsrooms are not uh, reflective um, in many parts of America um, of the people and of the communities that, they, that they, they cover. So there's just much work that has to be done to rebuild that trust. And one of the um, reasons why so much of our effort is focused on local is that there is a belief that we can help support building trust one community at a time. So Mirta, um, there's such an emphasis in the recommendations on uh, reminding people about journalists, about the value and importance of ethics, and, and we exchanged um, words before this about really, we really have to remind journalists mm -hmm. of the importance of, of ethics and radical transparency. And what are you seeing on the ground in your work? And something else I would love for you to talk about is there are high levels of trust uh, among the audience for Spanish language media. And so what might we learn from Spanish language media to rebuild trust? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jennifer. So um, I think ethics, um, you know, we've always had ethics. I, can't, I, I also, not only did I teach, but I was also a student at the Graduate School of Journalism. And I don't remember a time when we didn't teach ethics. It was always a course, as far as I can tell. But I think it's uh, now more important than ever to remember those uh, lessons. Um, I think it's important to develop, if the organization doesn't already have them, a set of standards, uh, guidelines. Uh, we have them at NBC. Um, it's a booklet about this thick. I brought it on Monday. I actually showed it to the audience. I didn't bring it today, unfortunately. But um, I was surprised, actually, when I, I'm a print person all my life. And when I went from print to television, I was surprised to see, at least at NBC, that they follow very, very strict guidelines 
and I say they because at the time it was they, now it's we, we follow very strict guidelines uh, at NBC and at Telemundo. Um, we train our employees, um, not necessarily new employees, all employees, so employees who've been there for 20 years get the same training, updated um, every 18 months or so, um, sometimes every year. And every new employee gets the guidelines which are updated every year or so. So it's a very rigorous process, and I think every news organization ought to do so. Um, we are transparent within our organization about our, our guidelines. We don't, however, release them to the public, and this has given me a lot to think about. Mm. It's something that I'm going to bring up in my own organization. I do believe that the New York Times that also has very, uh, of course, uh, a rigorous guidelines has them yes. uh, online and everybody can read them. Um, other organizations do as well, so, but, but we don't. And, and it's something to think about because I think it's important for the public to understand the process we go through. I, I do like the concept of um, radical transparency. I think, I think it's a great idea to let people know what we do and how we do it. And in fact, before I even knew about the work of the commission, I was not part of the commission, I had come up on my own um, with an idea that I didn't actually share with anyone. I had, I had called somebody at Miami Dade College, but she hadn't called me back to tell her my idea, which, which was to reach out to the community because I thought I had an encounter with someone. Um, I'll tell you quickly an, an anecdote. Someone who told me that a reporter had, um, he witnessed a murder-suicide and reporters attempted to talk to him because he knew the victims and he refused to. But the story he would have told reporters would have humanized the victims in a way that would have been healing for the family. And when I told him so, he understood. And I realized that nobody had actually explained to him the power of journalism. And I thought, if we could, if we could tell people what we do and how we do it, and why we speak to witnesses of crimes, and people who, who are grieving, because people don't understand why we do that. Maybe it'll go better. Um, so I think it's important. I also think it's important um, at, to tell people in this concept of radical transparency, um, when we're writing stories and we're producing stories, to tell them not only what we know and how we know it, but equally important now is what we don't know. Right, because often we leave that out. But I think we need to tell people right now what we don't know. And what we're working on getting. This is what we don't know, but we're working on getting it. Uh, to be completely transparent about the process. Um, and as to your second question, I think I don't have the numbers. I looked for the numbers, but my instinct tells me that there's a greater level of trust um, in Spanish language media, and I think it's easy to imagine. I mean, think about it. If you are an immigrant, a newly arrived immigrant in a country, you don't speak the language, who are you going to turn to for information on flu shots, uh, a measles outbreak, uh, snow day? You turn on the television and you realize that your local news in at least two networks are telling you what you need to know, radio, newspapers, you're gonna trust them, right? These are people that, I mean, it's like the Walter Conkright of its time. We have it in at least two networks. So um, there is a greater level of trust. And in, in Spanish language um, television, we really do meet people where they are. And what do I mean by that? Um, often we hold, for example, right after the election, uh, at Telemundo, we held town hall meetings. We wanted to know how the community felt. I mean, there was a lot of fear. People were afraid. And, and that was the word we used, right? Just dealing with the fear. And so we held town hall in, his, uh, in a lot of cities that were, you know, eminently Hispanic cities in Chicago and LA. We talked to people, and our main anchor, anchor Jose Diaz Ballard, talk to people, we brought lawyers. The, the main topic, of course, was immigration. What's gonna happen now? And we gave them a voice and we allowed them, we uh, served as a conduit between the lawyers who had the information and the audience. And so I think when you do that, you get closer to the people 
Uh, you're providing a service, but it's also a source of stories. You're mining the community for ideas because you're filling their polls. You get to know what you're thinking about. That old-fashioned thing called listening. Exactly. <laughs> that old-fashioned community. Um, 